Hi, it's Kernitex here with a guide on a way of repairing a Denon UDRA F10 amplifier that has lost sound in one or both channels. So what I'm going to do is just go through a few pictures I took of the uh, dismantling of the system, uh, the component that I'd identified that was faulty and putting the system together. So the first picture I've got here is um, the cabinet, the rear view of the amplifier and the first six screws that need to, remove, need to be removed. So there's two down each side and there's two here towards the um, middle of the top um, cover lip that need to be remo removed as well. Um, one thing you'll notice is the two, mainly two different types of screws that are used. There are these um, shorter black ones, which are metal screws. They've got a very fine thread there. Um, screws that screw into holes, which are themselves in metal. So the, in this case, they're screwing into the back panel on the back here. And the side ones, they're screwing into the chassis. Um, there are other ones that have got a... Um, a larger pitch which just screw into some form of plastic but we'll see them um, there are some that are black so you can't just go by the color there are sort of um, metal colored ones mostly which are the ones that screw into plastic um, but the black ones most of them are screwing into metal but there's a, there's a few we'll see that do screw into um, plastic so move on to the next screen and you'll see here this is the back panel now you can just about see at the top that the uh, lid's been taken off um, now there's quite a few screws on the back here that need to be removed the ones that hold the back panel on are these three with the arrows pointing downwards so there's one there in the middle that's still in place and then there's one either side which screw into the side of the chassis they're the ones that retain the back plate so I'd leave them till last and unscrew all of these other ones, which as you can see, they're like a silvery metal color. That's because they screw into plastic retainers that hold on um, the brackets where all these connectors are. So if you start on the left here with the aerial sockets and then move your way across to the uh, phono sockets, then there's the main, two for the mains input and one for the um, bracket that is holding the um, speaker connectors and once you've removed all of those then remove the um, three chassis screws um, there's a sort of a reference for later I will show this this um, slide again later when uh, I'm going through um, assembling the amplifier um, but as you can see the they're all the screws for the for the connectors are the same except for there's three of these these little black ones which are for the chassis as I say there's one in the middle and one either side towards towards the bottom and you can probably just see there the threads a lot wider than it is on the black ones because it's it, I presume it's some sort of tel self tapping yeah they are self tapping screws to tap into the plastic. So here we've got a shot of the um, inside of the amplifier and yeah there's lots of dust in there. I, I can't remember how old this is now, it's probably 10-15 years old or so, so it's, it's that amount of dust. Um, but uh, you know that's one thing you can do while you're inside here is to clean this all out because unfortunately we've got to remove all, all of these circuit boards in the main body to get to the baseboard. Um, the symptoms I was getting with this was I wasn't getting any sound at all in the right hand channel. The left hand channel is fine. The right hand was getting absolutely nothing. Um, I don't know if you can just see here, I plugged in a, a pair of headphones into the headphone socket to see if I was getting any sound from the headphone socket to try and narrow, narrow down where the fault was. And that too um, also didn't, didn't work on the right hand channel. 
Um, now on closer inspection, you can see that th this circuit board here that's sort of tucked away in the corner, this is the board that's got the um, headphone socket mounted on and these wires here run right to the back to the circuit board where the speaker connectors are and basically all these wires are for turning off the loudspeakers when you plug in the headphones so that the sound is channeled through to the headphones and disconnected from the speakers. So because I wasn't getting any sound in the uh, headphones the same as I wasn't getting any sound from the speakers I started to assume that um, the problem was on the final stage of the output so if you like the amplifier was fine um, it was just the output stage that wasn't working and to try and prove this further what I did I went around with a multimeter and just if you see here this board here is the main power amp circuit it's got four power transistors uh, just below these gaps here and obviously this is the heat sink for those power transistors and you can see there's basically two almost identical circuits and that's because there's one for each channel left and right so what I did was I went around with the multimeter and just checked against the earth you know anywhere where there's bare metal basically the chassis or the um, heat sink here and just checked some values obviously with the power off just took some readings and compared each side of the circuit just bear in mind though that the um, I presume it's the amplifier chip here on this heat sink on each side on each channel it is actually reversed you can see the screw head is going in on this side just above the plastic of the chip and on this side the plastic is on it's like it's reversed um, and even the heat sink is reversed as well that angle is reversed so it's just something to bear in mind if you do do that to prove whether you know, if you've got the same or similar fault, to just check that the amplifier is working. And as I went round, I did find that I had exactly the same readings on either side. When I say exact, you know, to within maybe one percent um, reading. You know, ne negligible, negligible difference really. So that started to make me think, oh, it's got to be on the final output. Um, so. I started dismantling further and um, as we'll see I, I came to a component which I immediately assumed would, would be the fault, would be the problem. Now before I go any further I um, must warn you about mains voltages. You can see I've got the lead plugged in here. It wasn't plugged in at the mains but I wouldn't advise you to leave it in this end because it's a quick visual cue to you. If you don't see the mains lead in you know for sure that there's no mains anywhere on the unit. If you leave the mains lead plugged in like this, you've then got to make an additional check to see if it's plugged in and is it switched on at the mains. So don't do what I've done in this photograph. This was just a one-off when I was testing it, this, this photograph actually, um, testing the fix. Uh, so it's a bit out, bit out of sequence, but for our purposes, it's, it's in the right sequence. But yeah, don't, don't work on it with the mains lead plugged in. Just unplug it and you can be safe then. Um, when it is plugged in, if you do test it, the only live bits are this circuit board. So the two leads out of this connector are live, the fuse is live, and probably these two unused fuse connectors, and obviously the connectors on the mains socket as well as the tracks underneath will all be live. So just be very careful. After that, it goes into this transformer. I'm not sure of the exact voltages, I didn't take any readings, but when I was taking readings on this um, amplifier board I was getting readings of about 30 volts DC as I remember so you could be looking at sort of 50 volts maybe maybe 100 volts if it's plus and minus 50 volts so it won't well it's unlikely to kill you but um, it would certainly give you a shock if it is around that sort of voltage so still be careful and obviously if you've got any heart conditions or pacemakers then you know maybe you shouldn't be doing this but um, just just be careful around this area this this area is going to be a, you know like i say probably about 50 volts or more um but certainly it won't be at mains voltage it is it is lower lower current in fact you can see these capacitors here um, which are part of the power circuit you've got a bridge rectifier there they're actually rated at 50 volts so chances are 30 35 volts is probably what you're going to see around here so it's, it's probably not going to be too bad 
there are a load of cautions and so on 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 the circuit board around this area so be careful there's probably a lot of current going around there as well if, if you do poke around it with it with the um with the uh electricity turned on so anyway um yeah we've taken off all the screws on this back panel i've left the back panel in here uh, but you can see it's sort of slightly away because there's nothing holding it on anymore you can see the um ma this mains um socket daughter board is is loose um all you basically need to do is unplug this plug it's got a little retaining clip on there so just push it and it should come away quite easily um, obviously you haven't got the mains lead plugged in so once you've disconnected this uh, input lead power input lead to the transformer it should just come away um, and that's the first ball to move out of the way and there's a picture with the back plate taken off and the little um, mains input daughter board taken away and you can see better how this um, connecting cable from the headphone uh, socket this this black bit here with these two screws either side here this is the actual headphone socket i don't think as i remember there's any components on this this circuit board it's purely a connector uh, it's just the socket the circuit board and then the connector and the lead going from that and that just plugs into another uh, connector just by the side of this uh, board the baseboard um, and when you look at the traces you can see it, it it's connected to these output uh, connectors for the speakers so the next board we need to move is this uh, daughter board here which is for the um, it's for the CD the phono and the aux in uh, that's what those three pairs of connectors are for and that I have to be careful with that because once you've taken the back back plate off it's just hanging by that connector so be careful with it there's nothing else holding it up but just just pull that away it'll be a little bit stiff just sort of wiggle it and pull it away and it will come away so the next thing we've got to do is to if I could just go back we're going to remove this uh, power amplifier part and the first thing to do is to remove these four screws here which attach the heat sink um, to the um, bottom of this, the, the chassis so this is the uh, two rear feet looking underneath the amplifier this arrow is actually serving serving two purposes it's just showing the direction of the front of the amplifier so the back's at the top and the front's towards the bottom but there's another thing that's important I didn't notice this until I was um, getting the pictures together um, I remember when I was taking the um, thing apart that there apparently was one screw missing but looking again at these pictures you can see there's not a screw in this um, plastic clip but there is one in this one so in the coming photos you'll see one photo where I've actually got this circled as a screw being in there but it's incorrect there is a screw missing on this one um, and it doesn't actually look like there's any threads that have been put into this uh, plastic clip either so it looks like it's left the factory that way without any screw in that position so it's, it's not a problem um, but it's just worth bearing in mind if you start scratching around looking for a screw you think it's missing um, in my case there was never a screw there and in fact um, the dust that was around that hole didn't indicate that there'd been any screw head around the hole either it, it looked like you know there's just dust around the hole um, but we'll see that when we come to it so yeah just unscrew these four black screws um, to remove the heat sink you just see the aluminium just behind these um, slots these grills um, and that they these four screws are the main four screws that hold on that heat sink and the um, power amplifier circuit board that it's attached to so that's how that's mechanically held on and there you can see that the whole unit comes away when you've disconnected these these holes here are basically what's on the bottom of this heat sink so it's replicated underneath and that's what the screws go into there's two connectors here that need to be pulled off and again similar to this connector need a little bit of effort just to pull it but once it clicks off it will come away quite easily um, and then you can just put the power amp to one side um, I've also uh, highlighted here the 
culprit once I took this amplifier wire and saw this more clearly it's obviously a relay um, my guess at the time was that it was to switch the um, loudspeaker off uh, when the headphone was plugged in so I assume that when you plug the headphone in it operated this relay relay and that disconnected the loudspeakers I actually later on found out that that's that relay is what switches every time you change the input device on the front panel via the remote control um, obviously so you don't get any um, thumping in the loudspeakers as the input is changed um, so yeah one, once I saw that relay that's the thing that I focused in on because it's a mechanical device mechanical devices more often than not fail sooner than um, semicon semiconductor devices uh, you know solid state devices and passive devices so that's what I started to focus in on incidentally this is the new relay like that, that I replaced so you'll notice two different relays in some of these pictures this in this picture um, this is the new one after I've done it but uh, don't worry I've, I've got some pictures of me replacing it so uh, don't worry too much they look very similar anyway but um, yeah don't worry about that so move on to the next bit of remove is this board that was next to the tuner board if I go back here it's this board here um, now there wasn't much on this board if we go on to the next picture again there's a couple of well in fact there's one um, integrated circuit this is just a, a, a foam pad to stop it to stop the circuit board touching this heatsink so that pad lines up with that heatsink when it's installed um, so there's not really a lot in, on here I can only assume um, being the front panel's got a lot of the logic on for the front display I can only assume that that may be a processor um, on this board and that the remaining ancillary uh, sort of computer type logic is on the front panel but I'm, I'm not certain of that it might just be a well I don't know it might just be a few logic gates for all I know I don't really know what it's for but because um, there's so so little on there but it's, it's obviously important um, so as you can see there's two connectors that hold this to the circuit board you might you have to be careful with it because when you pull this up the you're pulling on the circuit board um, you've got to try and wiggle it I you might want to try and put a screwdriver underneath it and try and pop it up um, although you've got to be careful you don't damage either the bottom of this circuit board or, or the baseboard um, obviously if you grip it you don't want to rip your th fingers on the back of the board um, there's not a great deal of room here um, but yeah take a little bit of wiggling to, to get that off um, but it, it will come just you know be gentle with it obviously it's um, the connectors could be quite fragile um, and there's also this flying lead here which connects with the front panel um, this this top circuit board on the front panel so uh, obviously you'll have to remove that first and then then the circuit board you can just pull it upwards and it will come away quite easily so the next thing you need to do on the side this is looking at the right hand side as you look from the front of the right hand side um, there's this earthing point with two um, flying leads for that um, need to be earthed so you need to unscrew that next of all and what that will do is it will allow you to remove the tuner circuit board so this board's got all the tuner on it you can see the aerial inputs there's the um, demodulator there and some uh, logic and some uh, ferrite cores and so on um, and crystal there and so on so be careful when you take this off again you don't want to uh, move any of these cores these adjustable I can't remember what these things are called now in, uh, new years ago when I was into radios more but um, uh, yeah you, you don't want to touch them because you could put the uh, tuner out of adjustment and um, that's not what you want to do at this stage it'd be uh, I would have thought nigh on impossible to tune back without any sort of documentation um, again this has got two um, connectors on the bottom but they're all at one end so you should be able to yank the circuit board from this end which is the rear panel end and pull that upwards and you can see there's one of these flying leads that goes directly into the uh, baseboard and the other one goes into the tuner into the tuner board so the um, sorry next 
picture just shows the screws that need to be removed to remove the baseboard from the chassis because the actual replacement or well i test it first of this relay um is you know obviously we don't need the chassis we can get rid of this and we need to get to the underneath of it to to solder the connectors so it's got to be pulled out of the chassis you can see why we've had to remove all the other circuit boards that are attached just to get to this relay and to get underneath the uh, relay so um, this is the um, uh, plastic connector that i thought had a screw in which it doesn't actually have a screw if you can see that hole there you can see there's a, a zone around the hole which hasn't got any dust on it but this hole hasn't got any dust on it at all sorry it has got dust all the way around it so that that's two things that tell me there was never a screw in there. The first was that there was no threads cut into the plastic, and the second is there's there's no dust shadow around the hole. It's it's dust all the way up to the hole. So ignore that that hole there. But that that hole is where that locates over that that pillar there, that standoff. And you can see that there's three metal screws that go into the baseboard. Or through the baseboard and into the chassis there's this one over here this one connects to this tab here and this one connects to this tab here now I've put two circles around this one because this one is a special screw it's got like a flange or a built-in washer to the head of the screw if I go back one or two there is a photo with it on somewhere maybe there isn't no maybe that's later on then um, we'll see that later on but basically what happens is that that screw you can see there the big area that hasn't got any dust on it it must ground through the shaft um and then through the uh flange or the the fixed washer onto these two links so that's where the main grounding uh must come from as well as this flying lead so it must be some sort of backup that this is um grounded in these two locations um, and when I came to test uh, the repair, I didn't actually put this screw in because I, I, I'd screwed this flying lead in. So they're both connected, so it shouldn't have needed. It was, you know, shouldn't have needed to screw this back in. It was okay for for testing, but you, you have to remember that this particular screw goes in this position to, to ground these two links. Um, so yeah, this is the um baseboard as it's been removed you can see there's two connectors to pull out there's this one with the thicker cables so that's obviously the main power um input and that's probably for the uh the power supply for the amplifier and there's there this this little one with some narrow connectors which i imagine is probably i don't know i guess something like five volts maybe 12 volts for the i guess it's for the front panel for all the electronics in there which would be lower voltage obviously so once that's pulled away um, now this these next few steps are optional um i decided to take the front panel off in case i scratched it or did some damage to it the only thing was when i took it off this plastic of the display doesn't actually remove that stays there and that's probably the most vulnerable bit actually um, but at least you can get rid of the um, aluminium front panel and um, you know keep any scratches off of that um, so basically what you need to do is to initially remove two screws that, that go into the plastic shroud that the metal attaches to. So there's one there and one there. And then there's two tiny little screws which screw into some tabs either side of the front panel and they go into the side of this plastic shroud. When, that, when that's done and you remove the bottom screws, there's these four tabs here. And you can see they're in a the closed position at the moment and see them in the open position or, or with the metal plate removed so if we go on to the bottom now you see there's two more screws holding these tabs in on the bottom and there's two more interlocks here little plastic tabs which hold the front panel in as well and again this is as it is when it's locked into place so when you remove the front panel this is how it should look you can see this ridge here is what was locked in in these holes in each case and again with the bottom you can see this plastic tab was located inside that hole in the metal 
and the same there you can just see it poking behind the foot there it was located inside that hole when you remove the front panel um, you can also remove this plastic panel now this again is optional you probably don't need to do it but bear in mind that these two plastic tabs are the only thing that hold the the plastic panel on um, so if these got broken like if you dropped it or you know did something with it and you broke one of these tabs that's probably not a good thing so it's probably a good idea if you are removing the front panel the metal uh, metal fascia to actually remove the plastic as well so although it's it will be flexible um, because we're not going to detach the front panel panel completely and I'll show you why in a moment um, it just means that if you do knock the front panel you're not going to put any stress onto these tabs and potentially break them um, you know when we're turning the chassis over and the, the main board over and so on so when you take the front panel away there's three loose bits that fall out there's um, this bezel and that's the back side of the bezel so that that part there faces into that hole there there's the uh, infrared um, plastic bezel that goes into this recess here and the front part goes into the hole there and again that's the back that's upwards and then there's this little um, sort of optical device that sits in this recess here in the panel and there's three sort of tubular bits that poke into these three holes here with the um, I think it's the RDS and EON lights and so on uh, LEDs these are so just bear in mind that when you pull the metal off that these three parts will just sort of fall away um, yeah, just sort of don't lose them or anything as it is as, as you take it apart so if we go back to the uh, baseboard and the chassis view again you can see again this is the part that we'll be working on from now on so you can put the chassis to one side it's not connected anymore remember that the front panel is only now connected by two sets of flying leads this brown and white bundle of leads here and this brown and white bundle of leads here and this ribbon lead here now some of these ribbon cables can be a bit, bit of a pain to remove and they're a bit fragile so I decided to leave this leave it in rather than uh, remove it um, but even then with it still attached you've still got to be careful you don't kink it or or pull it or anything like that um, you can remove this cable that connects the headphone socket to the speaker output but if you leave that in it, act it actually adds a bit more support to these cables here uh, being as it's connected to the front panel so I would leave that in it just um, it'll make things a little bit safer I think and of course this is the relay that um, was heavily under suspicion as to being the culprit so that's that's what we'll be looking at now um, and there's a view of the old relay as it was before I removed it you can see that um, it's a single pole double throw I think I got that right so single pole and there's two two throws on either side and they're normally off contact so with the power off these two connectors on either side uh, are open there's, there's no connection and basically when you look at the traces on the circuit board you'll you'll see that the left and right channels on the back via this cable here which goes via the headphone um, come via these contacts so basically one of these sets of contacts is the ground and positive for the left and the other set of contacts no not ground or positive it's the positive for the left and the other set is the positive for the right so basically the when this relay is energized the connection is made and the sound from the power the electricity from the um, power amplifier is fed through either to the um, headphone uh, or to the uh, output so this relay was not for switching when you plug in the headphone it as I said before it was purely a device to prevent thumping when the source input is changed so it's what you hear 
when you're changing the source input, you'll hear a click. And when you power on and power off the device, this is what's clicking. Um, and there's some specifications that you can see there. One sixth of horsepower. I didn't know there was a horsepower rating for relays, but reading up about them is something to do with the coil ca characteristics. Um, or is it the me I can't remember now? Or is it the mechanical? Is is the mechanics of the? Sorry, yeah, I think it's the mechanics of the switches, um, and the power that the switches can switch: 120 volts, 220 volts AC. Um, and then the coil is a five amp at 24 volts, 240 VAC, and it's a resistive coil. So. Um, as I said, I didn't know much about relays, but armed with this information, a bit of research on the internet, and I managed to find a replacement, an ex well, almost exact replacement. This one switches 24 volts. Um, I think the one that I found, sorry, the coil was 24 volts. I think the one that I found was a... Uh, 30 volt was it? I can't remember the, the details now, but it was it was slightly overrated. But the the coil was the same volt, which that was the main thing. It was the switching volt, which it was slightly greater. I can't remember what the details were now. Um, but I, I'll show you a close up of that 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 relay, the replacement relay, um, with the part number if you want to look it up. Now I'm in the UK, so I ordered the part from. Uh, radio spares RS. Um, it was only about two pound or two pound forty or something like two pound thirty, free postage. So, you know, if it wasn't this, I didn't have a lot to lose. Um, you know, a couple of quid to replace it. If if it wasn't the problem, well, you know, it's only a few quid that I've lost and a bit of time. Um, so yeah, that, so when you find a replacement, you need to obviously make sure it matches these these criteria. And this is the um, part number of this um, relay, the old relay that was 40. It's VB24SMBU. The 24 indicates the coil voltage, you can see down here, 20 volts DC. And SMBU was the actual part number, which I can't remember what each letter stood for. But when you look at the manufacturer's data sheet, it you know, specified the characteristics of the coil and the, the switching as well. So what I did first of all, because I assumed that one of these contacts wasn't switching, um, I decided to short out the contacts, just um, soldered a bit of wire across the, each contact. You might notice carefully that this contact's actually broken here. And um, what I did when I'd soldered it, I tested it and it worked. So that proved that it was the contacts of the relay not working on this side, whichever, uh, well, this must have been the right side because it was the right channel that wasn't working. And um, after that, to prove again that, you know, I was keeping my sanity, I just broke this connection, powered it up again, tested it, and, yeah, it, it was faulty again. So it just proved that by bridging this these two connectors that the relay was actually faulty. So once I did that, I just desoldered these two links and then with a um, uh, bit of soldering and some solder remover, I use a, a solder sucker, which was quite safe on these these tracks because they're, they're quite chunky. They're not like some of the fine tracks you see on you know, computer circuit boards and so on. Um, or you could use a braid. Um, or if you've got a proper desoldering station, obviously use that. Um, and this is what I was left with. You notice the contact holes are slightly bigger. I believe that I believe that's because the coil pins are round and the um the switch contacts are flat blades and that's probably why these are slightly bigger. So that's just something to bear in mind if, if that's a problem for you. But yeah I just um desoldered that and removed the old uh, relay. So this is the replacement uh, relay that I uh, purchased from RS and this number up here is the part number if you want to look for it. It's JW2 little a SN DC 24V. And, and again, these letters signify the characteristics of the coil and the switches. So if you get that, um, 
uh, relay, uh, this Panasonic one with that serial number, with that model number, then um, it'll, it'll be the correct one for this this particular hi-fi unit, this particular amplifier. Um, I imagine that's the coil voltage, 24 volts DC. And I guess this is probably the rating of the switches, 5 amps, 250 volts. Um, but as I say, when I checked all the details, RS are very good. They've got lots of details about the... the um, the, uh, the characteristics of their components and so on. So I was able to match it perfectly. As I say, I think the only thing was the I think the contact rating was a little bit higher, something like that. I can't remember the exact detail, but it was it was otherwise it was a good good replacement. So here's the new relay in position and all soldered up. So all shiny solders, no dry joints or anything. Just check it, make sure it's all okay. Um, before you test it, make sure you've not bridged any of these gaps and so on. And then what I did is loosely I put everything together. I didn't screw anything together. The only thing I did um, screw back was this earthing point for the two fly leads. So there's one for the tuner, one for the main board. And starting at the left, I plugged in the headphones because I knew the headphones didn't affect the fault the fault affected the headphones or the speakers. So I didn't need to test the speakers. Testing the headphones was fine. Um, it's just a matter of remembering which connectors go where. So this flying lead goes into here. There's these two power connectors here. These two connectors into the power amp. Plug in the connector to the main circuit board. Plug your mains lead into the circuit board. And also, because I was there's nothing else connected. You've got to check the tuner. So I plugged the aerial in. I actually choked, uh, plugged in the FM aerial uh, to test this. Um, and then when that's all set up, plug it into the mains, power it up, listen to the headphones, and hopefully you'll get what I got. And that's both channels working. Check the balance as well. Make sure the left and right works as normal. It should do because that's nothing to do with what we've touched. If everything's okay, you can go back and start cleaning the circuits up, circuit boards up, clean all the dust, just go around with a hoover and um, put it back together. So to mount everything back and put the screws in the right position, just go back to these uh, pictures that um, I showed when we were dismantling it. So it's just in reverse, obviously. So like I said, first of all, you've got these metal tabs these are the ones that got the metal screws in except for this one's got a larger flange on the screw head plug in the two connectors and then there's only three of these screws to go in to these plastic pillars as i say this one's not used so don't don't um distress about the fact that there's one missing there it was never there in, in my case it may be in yours possibly maybe it was, they forgot to put it in at the factory i don't know but as I say, it's never been in there from, from day one when they, this was manufactured. So this is a picture of the board cleaned up a little bit. Um, and you can see the locations of these screws that mount the, the baseboards to the chassis. So there's one there. You see there's an unused hole there. There's this one goes into that corner. And this is the screw with the fixed washer that screws into that hole there. And as you can see, that, that washer or flange will, will bridge those two links. And then this is another shot showing the screw hole that's not used and the other three which are used. And these are the three that go into the plastic standoffs underneath the baseboard. So next is to put the tuner board back in. So remember that there's two flying leads we're going to have to screw back in. And these are easier, obviously, to put in than they are to take out. You just locate the board. This is the bit that goes towards the front. This is the bit with the connectors towards the back. Just locate it carefully over the connectors and just push home. You'll, you'll feel it sort of go in and seat itself properly. And, yeah, like I said, don't forget to screw in, quite important, these two earthing points. Uh, these two, oh, sorry, these, these two fly leads on this earthing point. Then next we've got this, what I presume is a microprocessor board. 
So again, just locate that. This is the rear. This is the socket which had the um, daughter board in for the phono sockets with the CD aux and um, CD aux and phono uh, phono sockets. Um, yeah, just push push this circuit board down on top of those when when you've located them. Like I say, this pad will rest against that heat sink. And finally, don't forget to plug in this brown connector lead into this top circuit board on the front panel. So next we've got the um, uh, the power amp to go back in. So just position the heat sink in, inside this hole here. You can see the shadow that's in the dust there. This is obviously before I, I cleaned it, this picture. It will locate back on direct, directly onto the chassis and plug in those two connectors. Flip over the um, unit to look at the back, uh, sorry, to look at the bottom. And again, these are the four screws you need to screw back in. These go into the heat sink. Once again, there's that standoff with no screw in it. This is the front pointing downwards. Uh, so the back is to the top of the picture. And then is the daughter board, this little daughter board with the CD, phono and aux connectors. And that just pushes straight in there. As I said before, once it's plugged in there, it's just dangling there. It's relying on the mechanical strength of the connector. So try not to push it or catch it or anything uh, in case you damage the, the connector. Then we've got this power board it needs to be connected back into this flying lead which is the mains input into the transformer. And there it is in, in place. So this this board is just resting here on top of the um, the speaker connector. So obviously you don't want to be plugging it into the mains at this point. Or it would do irreparable damage if, if any of this metal's touching underneath. But yeah, that's that's the circuit as it should be when it's connected. So now we come to replace the front panel. So first of all, slide the, or clip the, or we're going to be clipping the um, plastic shroud uh, at the bottom into the chassis. So it's just these two clicks here. So it's fairly straightforward. Um, now this is probably the hardest part of the lot for me. Um, we've got to put these plastic backs into the retaining holes here so this is the way they would look as they go in and they're just like little bezels when you see from the front these two have got like a silvery finish to them and this is just like a flat dark um, panel when you look from the front um, now the problem is when you try to put this back on these can fall out and it's quite fiddly to be able to get the unit uh, in place on on top of this without scratching this and without having these fall out and you've got the weight of the unit and bearing in mind how the plastic is on the plastic shroud is only attached by the two tabs to the chassis it's, it's quite an awkward thing to do um, but there you can see these parts in place as they should look before you attach the uh, front panel to the plastic shroud and this is the shroud in place it's about this time where these things can oops where these things can actually fall out um, if you don't get this right. So it's quite fiddly. Like I say, that's probably the hardest part of the whole uh, dismantling and, and re reassembling of, of the um, unit. But yeah, you can see there, that's that's how you should locate the, on the bottom at the top, strangely, and the top tabs, which is on the bottom of this picture, um, how it should look before you push it home fully. And so that is the front panel in place and the screws that you need to replace, the two in the top into the plastic shroud. And these two go through the plastic shroud into the chassis, which is why they're little shallow metal screws with the chamfered heads. And again, underneath just shows the tabs in, interlocked in the lock position and two more screws that um, go into the metal work into the chassis, the bottom of the chassis. And you can just about see here the bezels around the holes on the button, the 
power button and the uh, LED indicators. Um, now we've got the uh, back panel and again just a reminder of the location of the screws and these are all the screws that secure the um, connectors on the back panel so um, again you want to do this in reverse you really want to secure the back panel first so do these three screws here these three ones that go into the chassis the one in the middle and the two either side when you've done them then go and connect the connectors up um, just bear in mind that this is that little door to board it might be hanging down so you might need to just raise it slightly to make the holes line up but the others should be okay and here again is the picture of the screws in place apart from the two outer ones I can't remember why I didn't have them in at the time but yeah there's this one that's in the middle goes into the chassis and these two outer ones go into the chassis all these other ones are the ones that go into the plastic that um, hold the connectors onto the back or uh, the back panel and finally we can replace the um, lid so there's two on either side two of these screws that screw into the chassis on either side and two that screw into the top of the back panel of the rear and so now finally I've just got um, a few clips of video of me powering up and um, with the sound first with the stereo and then one with the left channel only working and one with the right channel working you know all for you know sort of two pound thirty or whatever it was you know just over two pounds and you know probably about an hour or so to dismantle it and um, do the replacement do the checks do the replacement and uh, reassemble the unit and um, I've saved saved the hi-fi for you know maybe another 10 or 15 years so thank you very much for watching if you found the video useful or indeed if you've um, got a model that's not quite the same as this one um, or it's a similar one another Denon maybe I'd be, I'd be interested to know it'd be handy you know for other people to know um, if you'd like to make a put a comment in saying that it, it worked for you or if you've got a similar unit with a you know similar internals um, I'd like to hear that um, and if you enjoyed the video please thumbs up it and uh, if you want to see any more sort of technology related videos please subscribe to the channel to get to hear about any future videos that I do uh, thank you very much for watching goodbye